Patipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Namo Tasa Bhagavato Alahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Alahato Sama Samputasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Alahato Sama Samputasa Itipiso Bhagavā Alahang Sama Sambudo we jarana sampano sugato loka we do anutaro purisadama sarati satate wamanu sanang bodo bhagawa Tamahang Bhagavantang Abhipujayami Tamahang Bhagavantang Sirasanamami Suakato Bhagavatadamo Sanditiko akaliko ehipasiko opanayiko pachatang veditabo vinyuhi tamahang damang apipujayami tamahang damang Sirasana Mami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ujupatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Yaya Patipano 
Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Samichi Pati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Yati Dang Chatari Purisa Yugani Atta Purisa Pugala Esa Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ahuneo Pahuneo Dakineo Anjali Karaniyo Anutarang Punya Ketang Lokasa Tamahang Sangang Abhipujayami Tamahang Sangang Sirasanamami The pure-hearted one 
having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Very good. Three questions. Here we go. Ajahn Brahm, have you seen anyone you believe was enlightened that was not a monk or nun? Of course. Because that which is enlightened is not a person, it's not a body, it's not a a girl or a boy. What gets enlightened is the mind. Is the mind a monk? Is the mind a nun? What do you reckon? But I think what you really mean is, can lay people get enlightened? Please. because I have to sort of adjust some of the things which I say. I said the other day that, that there's no danger at all in just becoming enlightened. Actually, there is a danger. If you become enlightened, or if you get into the deep meditations, jhanas, you tend to lose your hair. <laughs> so I haven't seen any long-haired men or women. eventually, you know, become enlightened and you live a simple life. Remember what I said, what enlightenment is about those uh, children playing the wishing game, describing. When you're so content, you don't want anything in the whole world. You don't need any more wishes. It's just too difficult to live in a world like that. You just don't fit in. Even just as a monk, I don't really fit in the world. You fit into monasteries really comfortably because people expect the behavior. But a uh, story I say behind this is a few years ago that, oh, that, not a few years, I think last year, that I decided that oh, I'm old enough now to get the Commonwealth um, Seniors Card. Why not? I don't get any pension, so I don't want any pension. But I thought, well, you can, why not? So I got on the computer and applied for a Commonwealth Seniors Card. But then there was a problem. The problem was they, they said because of identity fraud, they, you couldn't just do it online, you had to go in. I don't know who would like to steal my identity. <laughs> in fact, I'd give it away for free if you want it. <laughs> Anyone want to be at your mother, you can come and see here and give all the talk. But anyway, they said, no, you have to come in. So I made an appointment with a local centre care. It's called centre care, I think, the same time I've been in their office. And I went in there, and uh, there was a lady who was doing the interview and said, um, can you uh, prove who you are? <laughs> and I said, for 46 years as a monk, I've been trying to find an answer to that amazing question. <laughs> I actually said that. <laughs> and she wasn't, she wasn't impressed. <laughs> she said, look, I need ID. I think some of you heard the story before, but it's an absolutely true story. I need some ID. Can I see your driver's license? <laughs> Don't have one. OK, uh, your credit card. Don't have one of those? Your bank account? 
No, I haven't got one. Um, your rental agreement. <laughs> I haven't got one of those, not for the Buddhist Society of Western. I won't pay them any rent. I built their huts, they should pay me rent. So. <laughs> no, I've got no rental agreement. <laughs> your house ownership. No, I don't have one of those. <laughs> and you know that this cracked me up, but they actually asked this. They said, your marriage certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'm a monk. <laughs> and I said, well, and then she actually said to this to me, she said, well, you know, you, you can't prove who you are, you don't exist. <laughs> and I said, yes, the Buddha was right. Because <laughs> <laughs> all the things which define you in the world, you know, monks and nuns, we don't have. So, but anyway, I did one thing which I did have, I do have dual nationality, British and Australian, so I had two passports. So we're not really supposed to do that, but okay, we'll let, off, let you off on this one. So I, I got my Commonwealth Seniors card. And I never looked upon that as being sort of, you know, hard to get, it was just like good fun. <laughs> I don't think she wants to see me there again. So anyway, so that's what happens when you disappear from the world. Here we go. Are men and women and other genders equal in Buddhism? They should be. But, you know, there's no reason why there should be any difficulty, any difference. We, we share everything. The only thing we don't share as uh, men and women are the toilets. Well, there was that fellow Rajneesh years ago. You know, he actually did, in his little ashrams, he did have uh, just co-gender toilets. So I, I never saw this, but a few people here that went to those uh, little places, and you just go to the toilet, and you just might be sitting next to a man or sitting next to a woman, <laughs> old or young. <laughs> it's a, a challenging thing to do, to go to the toilet when you're sitting next to someone of a different gender. It's certainly very... Um, you get a lot of uh, wisdom and uh, understanding about the... <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so we try and make it as equal as possible. But of course there's always more work to be done. So it's always work in progress and you, know, you try your best to give it as, as much equality as possible. And uh, equal access to everything, but it takes a long time to do that. It's still the case when some people, they invite you to their house, they've got a new house, and they usually invite the monks, not the nuns, or to give talks, or to give retreats. When was the last time a, uh, a Buddhist nun gave a nine-day retreat at Jarnagrav. Wasn't it just at Christmas then? That was only a weekend retreat. No, I had Terica. Oh, Terica? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that, that was online though, wasn't it? Not really here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me there, but that's great. <laughs> so why not? So, but in some places, there is still gender inequality. And I think one of the reasons is that in so many places, it's in Sri Lanka and all the different sects there, in Thailand, in Burma, it's like, it's, it's usually the run by you know, very old monks. I call them the movers and the shakers. They don't move very much, but they certainly shake. <laughs> They're all very old. And when you get very old, sometimes you just get a little bit um, conservative. You just don't want any problems. That's one of the reasons why the Buddhism was... I mentioned this, and it's, you know, it's very accurate to say that Buddhism is, uh, especially the Sanghas, is the longest continuous um, democracy, democratic institution in our world. Now, monasticism is democracy. I may be a really senior monk, 
But when we have meetings in Bodhinyana Monastery, it's just one, month, one vote. And I often get outvoted. And every time I get outvoted, I think, wow, what a wonderful system that it, this is. Just because you're the head monk doesn't mean that people do everything you say. The Sangha rules. And the Sangha is a local community. And that's one of the reasons why that, like even in Sri Lanka, they have this tradition of Mahanayakas, you know, like leaders. And well, it was once we were just, because we were having trouble trying to convince these Mahanayakas to, to um, respect the bhikkhuni ordination, but as we were doing research, where did these Mahanayakas come from? I know where it came from. I'm partly to blame because it's my ancestors, the British Raj. Because the British, you know, when they were ruling Sri Lanka and India, they were pretty smart. They'd learned how to sort of rule. And they realized that so many people respected the, the Buddhist monks. So they had to somehow get some power over Buddhist monks. And how could these Westerners get power over Buddhist monks? It's easy. You appoint them as, you know, that you are the, the head nun and give you a, um, some sort of salary or give you some gifts and give you a nice little fan to prove that you're the, the uh, Mahanayaka. But then, if you misbehave, they take it away. So, and you know, obviously the British were rich and they had their power. And so it gave uh, senior monks in some places status and also some income. And so it became quite popular to be a Mahanayaka. And that's actually where it came from. The British used that to get some influence over the Sangha. And so they could control sort of an important part of the Sri Lankan culture. So it's my, my ancestors' fault, I'm sorry. <laughs> but of course, and that's not how Buddhism really was, especially not in the ancient days. In the ancient days, every monastery was independent of the other monasteries. A devolved democracy. And that's why there never really was a head monk. The other thing which the Buddha did, which was famous, but very sort of uh, uh, influenced the, the growth of Buddhism in the world after the Buddha passed away, when people asked him, are you going to die soon? And who's going to take over? Can you appoint a successor, a monk, to take over after you? And very famously, the Buddha said, there will be no successor. After I pass away, let my teachings, the Dhamma and the discipline, be your teacher from this point on. So not a person, but our tradition of teaching and our um, discipline, our precepts, that became the teacher from that time on. Not a person. Because a person is always a bit vulnerable sometimes if they get too famous, too popular then of course that to popularity, that power, you know, can corrupt them. But if the Dhamma and the Vinaya, that's the discipline, the training, if that is you know, the head, the boss, then that's what you have to follow all the time. So every monastery is individual and uh, is separate and it runs according to democracy. Whatever monks or nuns reside in that monastery, you are the ones who run it. So that's why I, I cannot, sometimes I'd like to, to tell the nuns what to do. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way, but I can't, because Dhammasara is run by you. And it always should be. And same as Bodhinyana Monastery is run by the monks. Of Bodhinyana Monastery, not by any other monks, as it always should be. It's not perfect, but it's much better than having an an overarching leadership somewhere. So it's not just the monks and nuns. All the monks are equal in one monastery. In a sense, they all have the one vote. And whatever we decide. And all the, the votes, it has to be a, um, the everybody voting there. What is it? Um, it's not a vote by a majority, but uh, unanimous, unanimity. And so that if there is a one monk who disagrees, 
then they can hold up the decision, and sometimes they disagree so, so fiercely that we can't make any decision at all about that matter, have to leave it for another time. A lot of time, the monks and nuns are reasonable beings. So when we find, if I find out that you know, I'm in the minority, there's only me who doesn't want to go ahead with this, and all the other monks do. And of course, then I'll give in and let them just uh, vote with them. So that's actually how it works, how the government of a monastery works. Can nuns lead the monastery one day, or are forbidden? You do lead the monastery. Remember, it's not monastery, it's not just Bodhinyana Monastery. There's lots of monasteries here in Western Australia. And you know, you have Dhammasara Monastery. If you haven't been there yet, you should go. And that's the run totally by the nuns. As is how it should be. It's obviously got a different flavour. Monasteries will have a different flavour, reflecting the Sangha there. Some are strict, some are, uh, are quite um, kind, different monasteries reflecting different practices. So people sometimes they go to different places for different monasteries and that's also how it should be. You go to a, so one university and it's really strong in science and another university is really strong in the arts. Another university is really strong in nothing. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, I don't know. But whatever you want to go. It's not just men and women, it's just, uh, you see this, this, again, people of other genders. And that is, uh, we're, we're facing this question. There was somebody who was a trans, and they say, you know, can I become a, a monk or a nun if I'm transgender? And it's, you know, it's for someone like myself who has to make some choices, we also talk with the whole Sangha about it, it's a very interesting question. And basically, just you know, whatever they mostly look like, you know, if they're more male, then of course they go to Bodhinyana Monastery, if they're more female, to Dhammasara Monastery. But also, just can they fit in? Just like, you know, if a full male, if they will go to Bodhinyana Monastery, can they fit in there? Can they get on with everybody without causing any difficulties or problems? And if they, that's one of the reasons why that all people, when they want to join a monastery, they come and they stay for at least a year, as what we call the Anagarika, wearing white robes and keeping eight precepts for one year. It gives them a chance to test out whether they really want to stay and whether it's a, the monks, whether they fit in with the monks there. So it's a way that they can find out if that's the place for them. And if they can, Fine. You know, there was a time, this was oh, so many years ago, over in Thailand that uh, if you were gay, you weren't allowed to become a monk officially. I thought, that's a bit rough. But anyway, the first one of the men, I won't say who he is, a long time ago, and he was gay, and you know, everyone knew him, and he was always you know, really supportive, come on the retreats and help out in our committee and everything. And then when he came up to me one day, he said, I'm, you know, you know I'm homosexual. Can I become a monk in Bodhinyana Monastery? And even though it's illegal in Thailand to do that formally, but I thought, this isn't Thailand. And I knew him for such a long time, let's give him a try. And so for one year, he was an Anagarika there, and he was a wonderful asset to our monastery. Always very kind and very pleasant. So then he became a novice monk, and after novice monk, a full monk. And <laughs> now he's a senior monk. And I, I, Some of you know who he is, but he's not actually here right now. He's in one of our other monasteries, not in Western Australia, but in one of our associate monasteries. I'm giving the game away now. <laughs> <laughs> But he's this really, really great monk. And you know, you sort of think, wow, that's one of the really nice decisions I, I made. Obviously, other uh, men who are homosexual have also ordained. And as long as they can keep their precepts, no problem at all. And they're just a monk. So I'm very happy that we have a system here that you can learn, you train, 
and to see if you fit in. And if you can fit in with the lifestyle, marvellous. Anyway, dear Ajahn, what does the Buddha say about intuition? Buddha doesn't say anything, he passed away a long time ago, but <laughs> what Buddhism says about intuition is, now where does that intuition come from? What actually is it? And sometimes it's not just feeling uh, the situation logically, but feeling it emotionally. And the old story which uh, I say about intuition was an occasion when I was in Oslo University giving a talk and the lady put her hand up and uh, to ask her a question. The question was sort of if you have to make a really, really important decision in life, how do you make really important decisions? And I was sensitive enough or insensitive enough, depends on which way you look at it, to say, well, let's make it just like a real decision. You know, should you marry your boyfriend or not? At which point, she, I never guess you put her head to her hands, oh no. Because <laughs> her boyfriend was sitting next to her. <laughs> and that was decision. And it's, obviously it's an important decision. You know, you can't really know, you know how the relationship's going to work out. And it was really just um, testing her. She had to make a decision, yes or no. And that's where I told her, well, just you know, take out a coin, toss it up, heads I marry him, tails I don't. <laughs> and of course, people first of all laughed, they, even in Oslo they knew my characteristic and my uh, tendency to make jokes, but I said, this is more than a joke. Because you toss it up, heads I marry him, tails I don't. And suppose it turns up heads. How do you react? And if you think, heads I marry him, tails I don't, and it turns up heads, you think, let's try two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> and that is revealing your intuition, what's behind your logic, that you don't really want to marry him yet. But if it turns up heads and you go, yes, that knows, means you do. So the tossing of the coin is just to reveal just how you feel inside, the intuition, you might call it. And psychology has done many, many experiments on that, and the intuition you know, usually works more accurately than your logic and reason. So that's why the, yeah, we do know intuition is real, and I think the psychologists say it's like an accumulated memory of many experiences, and you can't really put it into words where you feel that this is going to work or this is not going to work, and you follow that intuition. There's also, you know, and again, many people have some psychic powers, but they just don't recognize them. You know, sometimes you feel that you know, there's something wrong with your body, or you want to go see a doctor. Or sometimes that somebody else is very sick. Sometimes you feel that. And that's, you know, also that intuition, the knowledge, which goes way beyond what you can hear and see. And an example of that, was, um, had this wonderful article in The Age, that's the old Melbourne newspaper, when I was visiting years ago, and the story of this vet, this quite a well-known vet uh, in Melbourne, and he uh, uh, finished work on a Friday, and going for a long weekend uh, with some friends, he was a single, a long weekend with some friends in a nice country house. He was driving in his car alone, and halfway on the journey, he just was overcome, he didn't know why, by this emotional crying. And it was so intense tears and sadness, he didn't understand why at all, that he had to stop the car in the emergency lane and park, and wait for about 20, 30 minutes until this sadness parted, and it, and, until it stopped. And he wrote about this in the, the newspaper, in a beautiful article. And when he actually got to the country house where they was having a weekend party, the message was waiting for him that his dog had been hit by a car and was killed. At that very moment where, about many 70 or 80 kilometers away, he was overcome by grief. 
He didn't have any other way of knowing that message, only he felt it. And it was so strong that he just couldn't drive. He had to stop and just cry. I don't know if you've ever had experiences like that. Sometimes you know that somebody's in trouble, someone very close to you in your family. Or, you know, even, well, a dog or a cat is in your family, to be honest with you. And you know that something's wrong. How does that happen? You do make connections with people, and sometimes you know, that is part of intuition as well. It's also one of the other reasons why, you know, in Buddhism we have this tradition of sharing merits or sending loving kindness to people, especially if it's someone very close to you who's maybe very sick or in a difficult situation. You think of them and you send them all this wonderful loving kindness and best wishes. And it's like just you know, cheering your football team and you're cheering your mother and she's on the other side of the world. But they receive it. In the same way that a dead dog can communicate with its owner and then only knows that something's wrong and feels great sadness. In the same way that you can use that positively and just think of someone who's really sick, dying, and send them all the very, very, very best wishes. And that can be done. So it's wonderful how we can do these things. Yeah. Yeah, but you can get like, I think a five cent piece, because that's, um, you can't sort of cash five cents anymore, it's taken off, um, is that right, five cents? One cent or two cents, you can get coins which have got no value. No, you can get one of those chocolates. Chocolate <laughs> coins. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> You can get somebody else to toss it for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's, it, that does actually reveal what you want to do. It's finding out what is your intuition. Sometimes we're not mindful <coughs> enough, aware enough to know that. So tossing a coin is one way of doing that. Yesterday you said that the positive way to look at the future is to look at it with hope. Isn't hope able to bring to deception, so deception to suffering, like a delusion? It can't be deceiving because the future hasn't happened yet. What hope does, it helps to create a positive future. You're looking at something positive which might happen and there's more chance it will happen. And a, Example which just comes to mind, again, is just relationships. If you think that you know, your, your partner doesn't love you, he doesn't really love me, sure he doesn't love me, that's what you think, instead of hoping he does love you, then your whole attitude is just totally different. And there are some relationships where the guy is so f afraid that his wife might leave him, He's so afraid that he can't really relax and can't enjoy um, her company. He's always really afraid that, oh, she's going, what's she going to? And that means that your fear destroys the relationship. So what you feared, you make happen. Or, even like with sicknesses, if you're really afraid that, you know, you might have COVID. <sighs> then it's more likelihood you will actually, you'll create it. It's really strange, even with sicknesses, even like with cancers, that sometimes what you're afraid of is what you make happen. You create those things. If you hope for health, there's a much more chance of you becoming healthy. It's weird, but I've seen that so, so many times. It's one of the reasons why your mind is very strong and it can create things, especially in the realm of your health and well-being. So, I will look at the future with hope. I hope there's baked beans for breakfast tomorrow morning.
is my breakfast man over there. <laughs> and maybe there will be. Is that deception? Because I don't know, I never tell you what to, what to make for me in the morning, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> so this is not really deception. Hope is looking at the future with a positive mind. Yeah, it's about baked beans. Yeah. Um, what you hope for, they may not hope for. Is that like, is it Oh yeah. You're hoping to do with another person. What you hope for is not what they hope for. So you try and if you're going to have some sort of hope, some aspirations for the future, something which is uh, more impersonal, then may you be well and happy. And, but it's also that's true. Some people don't want to be well and happy. So you've heard me say this to you, may you be well and happy if you want. <laughs> you don't have to be. I'm not going to be a control freak. <laughs> so the same with other people. Make it, may all people be at peace and free. And especially if you're visiting someone in hospital who's really sick. And sometimes, you know, you say, oh, may you get better. Maybe they don't want to get better. Maybe they want to make this their last uh, few days of life. And pass away. And you come in there and may you get better. That's one of the reasons why that when if you don't go and, do go and visit people who are sick, the last thing you should ever say is, how do you feel today? I'm in hospital, how do you think? <laughs> of course you don't feel well. And as somebody pointed out to me that when people ask you that question when you're in hospital, how do you feel today? It's almost you do. Um, bend the truth a little bit to cheer them up, to cheer your visitors up. Well, I feel a little bit better today when you feel really awful because that person has you know, taken their time to come and visit you and if you say, I feel terrible, of course that really disappoints that person, your visitor. So you're putting people in the spot when you go in there and say, how do you feel today? You say, tell them the latest joke. What's the latest joke? Oh yeah, there was that, that joke about the, the person who was so afraid of the future that he was a hypochondriac. No hypochondriac, whatever disease was in the newspapers, he thought he had it. So you know, he went to see the doctor and I really, really think I've got COVID. And I said, you haven't got COVID. But are, are you sure I need a test? So I gave him a test, no free, you haven't got COVID at all. Came in the next day, thought he had diabetes, gave him a test, no, perfectly healthy. Went in the next day, thought he had the plague. You haven't got anything. So the doctor was just so fed up with this guy and taking up so much time that he really laid it on this, this hypochondriac. You are a hypochondriac, you're fit, you're healthy, there's nothing wrong with you, stop coming here. Instead of being like kind and soft, he really shouted at this hypochondriac. So this hypochondriac, he was shocked. You don't usually get that from a GP. And he turned around and he walked out, he was stunned. Because he was stunned, he walked into, a, into the road and got hit by a truck and killed. And then the doctor ran out and saw what he had done and he was just so shocked that he was half responsible for this and he had a heart attack and the doctor died. So the two of them got buried on the same day. And the first night in his coffin, the doctor heard somebody banging on the wood. <laughs> he opened it up as a hypochondriac. <laughs> hypochondriac, doctor, doctor, you've got anything for worms? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a silly joke. <laughs> but anyway. What is this one? Oh. Do we always see the white light when we die? Or is it based on our karma? Where does it take you? How do you go to it? If you see it, do you have to go straight to it? Or can you say goodbye to friends and family first? <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> remember what that, that light is. It's sometimes not always a white light. It can be a golden light or any color. It's not really important. 
for the colorist, but its brightness and purity are important. And again, what actually is it? It's not outside of you, this is your mind, your, your jitter. So that when a person passes away, yeah, of course, they can go and visit people, first of all. Scare them. <laughs> That's why a lot of times people do visit their, their family and their friends. They've got to finish off all the old business. And the classic story of that, I'm, did I say this on one of the early talks about Mrs. Wong, Poon Sup? No. Okay, this is <laughs> this Thai lady that um, some of you have been around a long time may remember her. She, was, she had a husband, George, and she was always scolding George in public. George, you stupid husband, go and get this, go and get that. And I felt so sorry for George. He was being just really harassed all the time. And when it came close to Poon Sup's um, passing away, she came up to me and said to me that she, she was in a wheelchair. And she said to me, look, I don't trust my husband. He's hopeless, he's stupid, he can't do anything. And he, you know, he, he was listening. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, that I'm going to die soon, so I, I can't trust him to organise my funeral. So I jump around, I mean, I've been coming a long time, I really respect you. Can you organise it for me? I'll get the Buddhist committee to organise it. And I'll leave you know, half of my property to the Buddhist Society of West Australia in my will. And according to my view, I can't agree to that, accepting money, but I have to go and tell our committee. So there's a committee meeting and they said, yeah, that's, you know, that's fine, we can do that. So she put the Buddhist Society of West Australia in the will. And then, a few weeks later, she passed away. I did the funeral service for her. And of course, you know, as soon as the funeral service is finished, you don't go up to poor old George and say, cough up. <laughs> <laughs> he just waited for a while. And then you saw him every now and again and said, oh, have you found the will yet? He said, no, I, I, I've lost it, I can't find it. <laughs> That's what he said. And then, just this one more. It's one of these events I'll never forget. He appeared, George came in a taxi all the way from Perth in Bodhinyana Monastery about seven o'clock in the morning. I said, George, well, why'd you come in a taxi for? He said, here it is, take it, take it, please, now. I said, take what? It's the will. Here's the will. Take it now. So what happened? And he said, Poonsop came last night. <laughs> George, George, you stupid husband. <laughs> Get that will now and give it to Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> and poor old George. I mean, it's a true story, this is not a joke. He couldn't give me that will quick enough, he was terrified. You know, he'd seen the ghost the night before. And I was shouting at him, he thought he got rid of that. <laughs> but she was on his case and so he couldn't give, it didn't matter how much it cost for that taxi, he had to give me the will. <laughs> so that's what happens, and that's what goes do. They make sure that you, you behave <laughs> after they pass away. <laughs> that's the most extreme ghost story with wills and stuff, but it's true. But anyway, so after Poonsup has done that sort of business, then if they want to, you know, the mind is there, if they know what it is, again, they can actually go towards that. So, you know, it's just, it's not sort of uh, an opportunity and then it sort of disappears. It's just your mind. And so as your five senses get, get subdued, then that mind gets brighter, especially if you've been a good person. And you just allow yourself to go in. <laughs> Back down, I only start to meditate and have seen some images in a couple of my meditations. One is a red crystal, like lights. They come and go. The other is a good-looking Indian boy, <laughs> who I've never seen before. <laughs> oh, come on. That's what it says, I don't make it up. 
And sta okay. And the Indian boy is standing up in a village. Are they just my imagination? Could you explain? It's usually, if you ask me this question like in the interviews, I'd ask you, how did you feel at the time? And if you're really, really peaceful, you'd be meditating, you felt a lot of tranquility, and you'd be meditating for, you know, for a few minutes, and everything was really peaceful and getting calm, and that's probably is like nimittas. Now when you see like a nimitta, a lot of them are created by you, which is like when I, I told you one of those nimittas which I saw, Garfield, the cat. But one of the other nimittas a long time ago, which I saw, I was just meditating, got very peaceful, and I saw this image of a, of a demon. Had his big eyes, almost falling out of its sockets, and spiky hair, this was the days you know, before punks, so I didn't know that was a fashion statement. And it had uh, spiky teeth and blood coming out of one of its teeth and a necklace of skulls and its tongue coming out going <laughs> at me. And quite honestly, I wasn't at all scared. Because just like the Garfield cartoon, I'd seen this in like murals on Buddhist temples. You know, those, like Kali or whatever it's called. And I wasn't at all scared. I thought, let's have some fun with this. Literally. So I put sunglasses, Ray-Bans, over its bulging eyes. And I put a straw hat on its spiky hair with a little flower coming out. <laughs> I actually did this. I'm not exaggerating or joking. And I blacked out a few teeth. So it looked like it needed to go to the monster dentist. And I put a cigarette in the end of its mouth. <laughs> and I also managed to, to turn the, its lips upwards, so it was like grinning. I uh, humiliated that monster. And I had sort of laughed, and that image never came back again. So I never gave it fear. I had some fun with it. And that's sometimes when you have these nimitas, if it's, they're complicated nimitas. But sometimes meditation can be a little bit boring. You don't see any movies, you can't watch the TV. And so this is a bit of free entertainment for you. <laughs> and I say this, and there's not many monks say this, they say, no, enjoy yourself. You see something really weird, have a bit of fun there. You see a nice sort of uh, Indian boy standing up. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Because that makes this Nimitta land so interesting and fun. So you're not scared at all. It's just, these are your creations. If that was anything to do with your past life, you usually recognize that pretty quickly. This is just like a little bit of an illusion, a bit of a play, and you can play around like that. And once you get the, that playing around time finished, then you can, you've still got very good meditation, then you get peaceful, then you can go into the, the real beautiful nimittas. But maybe that's my character, but I think that's, I've taught that to people and I think it's very helpful. Because you get used to you know, what nimittas are. And you know, usually they're peaceful, but sometimes you've got a very strong mind. And sometimes the mind is a bit playful. You can have some fun. I, remember, I think the reason I say this is because I remember one Nimitta, and it was quite an active Nimitta, just sitting down quietly. And it was like this vision of me flying through the air and having basically a cycle, psychic battle with this Indian monk, a uh, Hindu monk. Zap, 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 zap. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good fun about five minutes and so I could come and behave. And so then I just uh, let that one go, went into real limiters. Being playful with your meditation makes meditation more interesting. And you're not scared at all because you can, you can control this. In a sense, you can just say, oh, let it go, I had enough. You're not afraid, you can take a monster and turn it into a clown. So it's, the, 
The red crystal-like lights are usually much better because that is more simple. So in the end, just incline towards the simple lights in the mind. The goblet, if you want a bit of fun, if you're meditating all day and you've seen those lights and you just want a bit of uh, R and R from the deep meditations, we a bit of fun. I don't know if I should say that, but I said it and um, I don't know why not. Ajahn, how can we sit down as a lay person without any wants? Temporarily. You're on retreat now. So you can sit down here not wanting anything in the whole world and just test what it's like. And you can have a retreat, a rest from the world of wants. And it gives you this wonderful rest. And it gives you lots of insights and understanding of why do I want things? What I want, are they really helpful? How much do you want? A lot of the things which uh, you, know, you get from not wanting very much is to see just how so many of these things you want in life are just created by our society, by watching the, the movies, you know, seeing the TV, the advertisements especially. They create many of your desires and wants, what's on the TV. And one of those things which you see on the TV is these big homes and houses. And I say that because I've been in some people's houses and they're huge. And the story was of going to this one person's house in, uh, it's on the river Shelley or something. Because, you know, it was a, it was, yeah, it was a Thai person, Thai Chinese. And they wanted to um, do a ceremony to bless their house. So I went in there, and as soon as I went in there, and this is, again, no exaggeration, come from Serpentine, and so I needed to go to the toilet. So where's the toilet? And she drew me a map. <laughs> no exaggeration, because the house was so huge. So I turned left, turned right, over there, and over here, and over there. And afterwards, I asked her, how many people live in this huge mansion? She said, only me. When she said that, just a whole wave of sadness came in my body. I said, well, why don't you live with some of your friends? She said, I can't trust them. They'll ask me for money. What about your relations? The same. Always asking for loans or for something, because I'm so wealthy. I'm even afraid of you, Ajahn Bob. You may ask me for a donation for the Buddhist Society. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that in this huge home, it was like her prison separating herself from all the people who could care for her and who she could care for. I don't know why people do that by these huge mansions. And the counter story to that was a lady who won the, the UK lottery some years ago. How much was it? About 40 million or something. Sterling, pounds sterling. And the first thing she did was again, buy a mansion for her husband and two kids in Sussex, this big fancy mansion, and she sold it one year later at a loss and bought a small terrace house somewhere. And because it was really weird, why when you got a mansion would you want to sell it at a loss and buy a tiny house? And she had said because she was losing her family. You know, she was in one part of the house and the house was so big the husband was somewhere else in the house. And the kids, one was in one part of the house, the other kid was in another part of the house. The house was so huge, she hardly ever saw her children or her husband. And it was actually killing the family. And so she got a very tiny house where they can't escape from one another, <laughs> seeing each other all the time. He said, I haven't got much space, but we've got love now. And I always remember that, just myself growing up with my brother in a small room, and just, well, her whole, whole life shared a room together. He became a banker, I became a monk. <laughs> Total opposite ends of the spectrum. But you know, we love each other and care for one another. As many of you have seen when he came here years ago for my, one of my birthdays. And it's just because we had to learn how to get together and learn how to live together in peace and harmony. Simply because there's no place to run away to. But in big houses, it breaks up families. So that's one of the reasons why you don't need to want a big house. 
So small houses are much cheaper to run. It's more, less um, problems for the environment. And you know, I live by what I teach. You see my small house? <laughs> my cave? So that's one of the reasons why that even a lay person, we don't need that much. And you can. Tiny houses now are, are much more popular. So I always encourage people to have tiny houses or apartments, flats. And these days, people have apartments. They're great apartments. You don't need a, a, um, a garden to have to mow. You can just stay on common gardens. You don't even need to have a kitchen anymore. You can go downstairs and go to the, the shops for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. And they do all the washing up for you. <laughs> you don't have to cook. Interesting lifestyle. So anyway, keep it simple. OK, how can we sit down as a layperson without any wants? Easy. <laughs> Maybe. Our daily conducts are full of wanting to obtain either in an object or a person. How can we make peace with the delusions we have not fully understood? It's find out what you want in life. What do you really, 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 really want? Even like sometimes when people get to the, towards the end of their life, that sometimes they have these bucket lists. And have you got a bucket list? What you want to do before you pass away? The first item on the bucket list should be not to have bucket lists. <laughs> Do you want to see the Great Wall of China? Or go and see the Wall of Bodhinyana Monastery. Same thing, it's just a wall. <laughs> Niagara Falls? Go in the shower and turn the shower on. <laughs> it's just water. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> so a lot of the time, I remember just when we went on a tour of the holy sites in India years and years ago, that we went over to, on the way back afterwards, we went through um, Agra and see the Taj Mahal. Have you seen the Taj Mahal? I remember just you know, standing there, and one of uh, our Buddhist society members, you know, she's usually from the Armadale group, she looked at that and said, what do you think about that, Ajahn Brahma? It's OTT, isn't it? Over the top. It almost like ruined the economy of India at the time. It's a huge thing. What for? Because there was a, a mausoleum for the, uh, the Khan's uh, wife who passed away. And he said, like, over the top, you look at that and you challenge people's perceptions of a beautiful edifice. Is it really that beautiful? Or has it sort of got this other part to it, which has cost an incredible amount of money? For what purpose? So sometimes, what do you want in life? So we always say that when you die, you can't take it with you. Or can you? There's this lawyer. This lawyer was really intelligent, and always trying to find sort of, you know, ways to bend the rules or work the system. And so when he was told by his doctor that he only had a few days to live, he was in his home on his deathbed, and he started figuring out how he can take things with him when he dies. And he came up with this amazing sort of idea. He told his wife, you know, to go to the bank and the suitcase he had to fill it up with $100 notes. So there's you know, quite a few million in the suitcases. And of course, you know, he had that money in the bank. And he said to his wife, in the room above my bed, the attic, just put those bags in exactly the right place above my bed just, you know, one just above my left hand, one just above my right hand. And then as I die, <coughs> as I go up to heaven, I can grab them and take them with me. <laughs> that was his idea. It's quite innovative. You've got to give him that. 
so the wife, the wife, you know, wasted time arguing with this guy. He was a lawyer. And so she did that, and a couple of days later he died. And, uh, you know, she did a funeral for him and everything. And then even after the, after the funeral, then she checked up to see if those uh, suitcases were still there. And of course they were still there. Of course they were still there. And as she saw this stupid husband, he should, put them, he should have put them in the room underneath his bed. <laughs> <laughs> I knew which way he was going. <laughs> so what do you want? How do we overcome severe fault-finding mind during meditation? Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, the fault-finding mind, sometimes that's a habit in, in us. And that fault-finding mind, it's trained into us and it causes so much trouble in life. And you can look at this place. Have you done any fault-finding for Jhana Grove yet? Four is too hard. We should have uh, better cushions to sit on and cushions with remote controls. So I can actually press one side, and then if I've got a sore knee, it can actually just come up this way. <laughs> and, and if I want to sort of, uh, raise my back, I, it comes up in the back. And if I'm too hot, I can uh, lower the temperature so it goes cooler. And if I need a, I've got sloth and torpor, I can press another button and get a cup of tea. <laughs> Because there's a lot of people meditate these days, and the cushions are the same we've had for centuries. And just you know, sort of something inside the sort of a round blob. Can't we have high tech cushions? <laughs> and sometimes fault finding does that. It wastes a lot of time. But in the end, instead of having fault finding where we're in a meditation, we just have a wonderful sense of appreciation. Fault finding is looking at the two bad bricks in the wall. We're just um, harming ourselves because you can't change the wall right now. But when you see the beautiful bricks in the wall, yeah, the cushion can be more comfortable, but it's not bad. And yeah, you know, we, we don't get breakfast in bed. <laughs> not even I get that. And I'm the teacher. Did you get breakfast in bed on your birthday the other day? No, oh, that's a fault for <laughs> But it's not bad, it's, it's good enough, it's simple. There's so many beautiful things in this retreat centre. There's no need to find fault. And of course the other thing with fault finding, it's become almost just the way we look at our world and the way we look at ourselves. And I've said this to quite a few people on the interviews, and I've said it many times in my public talks. But the story is, if you are a fault finder, then see if you can find any tree in this forest which has no faults in it. Find a perfect tree, which is dead straight, with all the branches equally spaced, with all the twigs, nicely spaced, and all the leaves nice and green, <coughs> and a bark which has got no damage on it. There is no such tree in the forest here, nor in Bodhinyana Monastery. Every tree is bent, twisted, damaged, and many of those branches have fallen off, leaving holes in those trees. And I love those trees. The more crooked and twisted they are, the more beautiful they are. They're not perfect, but they're beautiful. And you learn from trying to find a perfect tree and noticing the difference between a perfect tree and a beautiful tree. That we're all, as I say, damaged goods. Some more than others. <laughs> but if you are damaged goods, you belong, first of all. Like all the trees in this forest. And the most damaged goods, the most damaged trees, are usually the most beautiful. They're the ones you like to sit under or have your photograph taken next to. Straight trees, they don't really cut it. So anyway, that's why fault finding, you change your idea of fault finding. If you do look for faults, that's looking for beauty. How do I generate peace and love during my Meditation, it has 
been a long time since I have felt them. When I bring them to mind during breathing, it almost feels forceful. Should they just flow or do I create them? You don't need to create them, but you can sort of nudge them. Just a bit of love and uh, kindness and peace. Because they're there. You just need to look a bit deeper for them. Ah, oh, there you are. And when they do come for the first time, they may be shy. So give them time to develop. And when they do develop inside of you, it's beautiful love. And at the end of the meditation retreat, that's when I usually do the guided meditation on loving kindness. And it's very powerful because it works. And you feel this incredible sense of joy and happiness and love for all beings, but especially for yourself. And you can do it. You realize how it works. Just so stay with the idea of you know, some energy from within you, going out for the happiness and peace of all other beings. The kindness, the care. You know, on that one of those times I was doing a loving kindness meditation, there was one lady visiting here from Sydney, and she said, I, I can't give love, I, I don't like pets dogs and they just lick you and just this is so sometimes so dirty and cats are just just so just um, snobby and babies oh they're so smelly and dirty and so I couldn't find something which you could love to actually to start her loving kindness meditation on but then she said that in her apartment in Sydney she had a pot plant How's your pot plant doing? I said, oh, that little pot plant. I, I was thinking about it the other day and feel a bit sad that I'd left it by itself. It should be okay, but I worry about it. She had an emotional connection to her pot plant on her balcony. That was all you needed. I said, oh, just start thinking about that pot plant, how much you love it and care for it and wish it well. And that's what she did. She said, no, when she was meditating, you've, she imagined that pot plant and just stroking its leaves. I hope you do very well. There's enough water down there. Just put your, your roots a little bit further down and you'll find the water at the bottom of the pot. And she, she was actually, she found something she cared for. And just as she needed that, to actually generate the feelings of love. It's just the same if you light a fire. You need a match, some which easily takes the flame. And from there you can light something else like paper, and then paper kindling, and kindling bigger bits of wood, and then bigger bits of wood uh, like logs, and then logs. You can go from that into wet, damp logs. And the fire is so strong that the wet, damp logs uh, take the flame as well. And that's actually how loving kindness works. Find something easy first of all, which you really love and care for. And then from there it builds up. It's really nice, good fun. Even like a little, what was crawling on me today at lunchtime over in Bodhinyar Mod, a little spider. And a tiny spider, and I was just loving that little spider, a nice little spider. Made me happy and well. And then, because it was uh, a little ticklish, I gave it to uh, Ajahn Appy sitting next to me. Come on, uh, bring some joy to Ajahn Appy. He said, no, no, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> When you're kind to animals and give them love, they, they, they treat you really well. He thought it was a baby redback, but I couldn't see any red on it, but it was a nice spider. Oh my goodness. Okay, can you give some advice for when song lyrics get stuck or repeat while meditating? Yes, what to do there is bring it to the end of the song, whatever the song is, and at the end of the song, Make it really, really strong. What's a nice... It's not long since I listened to songs. Well, not a song, let's say the chant, which, you know, the um, meta chant. By not holding two fixed views, the pure-hearted one having clarity of vision uh, uh, will no longer come back to this world. So what you actually say will, no, will not be born back into this world. So when you get to the end, now this is a song, you start to say, we'll no longer be born back into this world. 
And that actually stops the song repeating itself. It has a finale. <laughs> so if you have, if you have a, like a song, some, what do they call it? Ear um, worms, I think, isn't it? Like pop music, which keeps going on and on and on in your head. If you give it a finale, slow it down, and really put some energy into the end of that song, that's a really good way to stop it. Ajahn, if we didn't want in some way, why would we do anything? Exactly. You wouldn't do anything. You'd have a rest, you'd be able to sit here peacefully. Why are people always doing things? Try something else in life. As I, many of you know, when I used to go traveling, go to lots of big cities, like Jakarta and New York and San Francisco and London. It's really rare in those big cities to see any human beings. What I ever see is human doings, human goings. Very few human beings. Very few people are actually being here. They're going somewhere. They're doing something. How about being here instead of doing things? Except, of course, when you're on the duty to make my breakfast in the morning, then please do things. <laughs> so does uh, wanting something motivate us to do wanting shelter, food, safety? Honestly, haven't you got enough shelter, enough food, enough safety, but we still want more? It's okay for basic needs, but we, that doesn't take much wanting to get basic needs. We still want more. When practicing letting go, getting rid of will, will the body automatically self-destroy, like cancer? Thanks. Uh, when getting rid of will, the body automatically self-destroy. Uh, well, I mean, destroy the sense of self. Yeah, that will happen. The body will still be there, nice and healthy, when you get out of the way. So that sense of will changes its meaning. So when you let go, let go, let go, the body vanishes and you get very peaceful. And this thing which you call the will gets seen for what it truly is. Now one of those um, experiences I had as part of the, um, the Cambridge Psychic Research Society, and uh, this was, uh, was seeing like a, a hypnosis, hypnosis being demonstrated in a lecture theatre. And of course, you know, with students, now you're students, you know, you volunteer for anything. So I just rushed up there to see if I could be hypnotized, but I wasn't a very good hypnotic subject, so I had to go and sit down again. It was great, because there's always one or two students, which is so easy to hypnotize. And so they had one, one, this one guy, like 19 or 20, they hypnotized him, and they gave him this suggestion. And the hypnotist said later on, when I touch my right earlobe, you will stand up, no matter what's going on, you'll stand up and sing the British National Anthem in a loud voice. And then he said, and I'm going to take you out of, uh, out of hypnosis now, but I, I want you to remember to do this when I touch my right earlobe. So we all heard it know what was going on, but this what kind of hypnosis didn't know anything which had happened. And so we were waiting for the hypnotist to touch his right earlobe. And he's a very good sort of good entertainment because he'd go up and just almost touch it and then put his hand away again. <laughs> so just build up the tension. And then finally he actually touched his right earlobe. And this young student stood up and started singing God Save the Queen in a loud voice. And it was hilarious. We were kidding ourselves with laughter. All the students, and maybe about 120 students in there, laughing their heads off. But that did not stop this student singing the National Anthem at all. He was really going for it. He sang it right from the beginning to the end. And, you know, we were just almost wetting our pants listening to this guy. <laughs> and at the end, the hypnotist, the lecturer, told us to be quiet. And then he asked the student, why did you do that? And then the student gave this really good reason for singing the National Anthem. And that was what chilled us. And I thought, whoa, 
Because as far as that student, an intelligent young man, he thought that he freely decided to sing the British National Anthem, even though it's the most ridiculous thing to do in a, in a lecture theatre full of students. But he thought it was his free will. But we all knew it was conditioned into him by hypnotists. And that really was a scary piece of evidence. All the other things which you do. Did you really decide to do that? Or was it conditioned into you? That's scary. <laughs> Is it possible to still achieve deep meditation sitting in a chair compared to sitting in a lotus position or on a meditation bench? Yes. How you're sitting, as long as you are comfortable, so it can be in a chair, can be in a bed, any posture is okay. And I said this story again so many times, that when I had typhus fever in Thailand, and in hospital about four weeks, and you know, I felt really, really weak, very tired, no one knew what was going on, what the sickness was, because apparently there was no typhus fever according to the health department in that part of Thailand. And the reason was because all the locals had got immunity. But you know, the foreigners going there, you know, that we all got eventually some scrub typhus. And anyway, it's just it's like typhoid. You know, it just really knocks you out with fever. And then just one afternoon, just decided to meditate. I don't know why I didn't do that before. And got into really nice deep meditation. And probably even during a fever, but certainly just no energy at all. Probably the, the most exhausted I've ever been in my life so far. And you know, four weeks of fever. And just got in a nice deep meditation. And when I came out of that meditation, I don't know why I did this, but I noticed my posture. <laughs> I've never seen that posture in any book, ever. You know, leg this way, leg that way, and I'm over here and I'm over there. <laughs> If you've seen anybody who's really sick in a, with a fever in hospital, you just they don't know how the body is, it's just all over the place. But it's a really, really, really deep meditation. So that actually proved to me that, you know, the posture is not important as long as you're comfortable. Dear Ajahn, you were talking about age limit to become a nun yesterday. Is it the same for monks? Do monks have to be younger than 50 years of age? What about Anagarika? Some of them seem to be in Anagarika for ages. Thank you, <laughs> great teacher. <laughs> and, it's, and it's true that even in the Ajahn Chah, he had this one Anagarika who was blind. He became the doorkeeper of Wat Pa Pong, the gatekeeper. He's an amazing man because, because he was blind, his sense of hearing was so sharp that somebody, that if you came from a monastery, the monastery car, you can come inside to park. Everyone else had to park outside. And of course, people tried always to get inside, and he was a blind gatekeeper. So oh, I'm from this monastery. He said, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. This blind gatekeeper was so smart. He could tell from your voice where you were from. Mm -hmm. And so he was blind. He stayed there for a long time. Imagine child would make sure he got well fed. And then what happened to him that one day he he went, uh, listened to the evening talk from Ajahn Chah, and he went back to his hut, and he never woke up. He died there. Beautiful way to die. And he thought, that guy had a lot of good karma there. He spent you know, quite a few years in Wat Pa Pong as the gatekeeper, even though he was blind. So we have people in white, people like Amanda, he's been there for over 30 years, I think. And, you know, but he helps out, so you can stay as an Anagarika, even like in um, Dhammasara, you know, sometimes you have Anagaric cars, you know, they can drive, they can cook, and they can do actually so many important duties there. So if you find one, I always say, sometimes the Anagaricas can also do the cooking. Novices can't do that. So if you find an Anagaric car who's really a good cook, don't ordain them. <laughs> I have lost so many good... <laughs> you know the, that monk Mutito, you know, he's one of our builders. You know, from Norway, uh, not from Norway, from uh, Finland. I only found out, he never told me, he's, he's very smart, he never told me when he's an Anagarika. 
that he was a chef and he was working in a five-star restaurant over in the Ritz-Carlton or something in New York. <laughs> Why did I ordain him? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> But anyway, now, of course, you give people a chance to do what they need to do in life. So we don't have that age limit, but what we do have is just your ability. Can you live in a monastery? You know, or can you contribute or do you cause any trouble and problems there? And so we take a person, give them a chance, and because quite frankly, and it's great for the nuns to hear this, but when somebody wants to become an anagarika or not, I can't tell if they're going to make it or not. And some of the people I thought would definitely make really good monks, and then they, they can't, they leave after a while. So even I don't know, but that's why I give everybody a chance. Whether they're gay, whether they're old, trans or whatever, give them a chance and see if they fit in. If they do, fine. And of course the reason for that age limit is because, again, the younger nuns have to look after you when you get very sick and old. Can you talk more about metta? How to evoke feelings of it if you're not a mother? I'm finding it hard to feel something on, on cue. Thank you. After a while, here you go, this is a nice little way of doing it. So, there's only two questions left. So close your eyes and listen to my voice. Love. Love. Kindness. 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 You can open your eyes now because I don't have too much time left. But hopefully you experience that after I said the word, there was a space, and it allowed the mind to actually be directed in a direction of what kindness is. And I repeated it again, again to give the mind a push over there, kindness. And you repeat it to yourself enough times, kindness, kindness. Then you start to feel it. It is like a signpost. And after a while, you don't need to signpost anymore because you're looking directly at what kindness is to you. And something like kindness is a very beautiful thing. By its very nature, it's very attractive. And once you have it in front of you, you don't need the words anymore. The kindness will keep you looking at it and enjoying it. There's many words you can repeat like that. And again, I started off with love, but then love is sometimes many, many things, like, you know, you love your, your breakfast or, you know, you love this um, uh, show on TV or something. But kindness is a bit more specific, more, more soft. So just mentioning kindness to yourself, it just evokes that feeling. And after a while, it's like you have kindness here. So that's one skillful means to evoke the kindness. Ajahn, as a young monk, did you manage to give 100% mindfulness to one of these long all-night Ajahn Chah talks? If so, what's your secret to arouse such mindfulness in such seemingly repetitive, boring situations? It's sometimes Ajahn Chah did give um, talks all night, but you know, I don't think I ever actually did an all-night talk with Ajahn Chah. Many hours, but not all night. And, uh, but the all-night meditation sits, I always thought that was a bit artificial because you had to sit. But then sometimes you really got some really nice meditations and you're there for hours and just having a wonderful time. The only way to do that is to let go. To let go so deeply, so fully, you can't feel the body, 
you don't know what's going on because you're inside. But the story which I think this relates to was the story of the little novice monk when Ajahn Chah was giving an all-night talk. He didn't know it was going to be an all-night talk. Ajahn Chah could finish it any time, but he didn't know. But anyway, this little novice was listening to Ajahn Chah's talk, you know, a boring one. And after about an hour, the little novice thought, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? You know, he was just a little novice, maybe 11, 12 years of age. The big monks, they could stay up all night, but little novices needed their rest. And so, when is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? He kept repeating this to himself over and over and over again. When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And then the little novice had an insight. An insight is sometimes just turning what you're saying around, putting, turning in another direction. And the little novice said to himself only once, when am I going to stop? And that little novice stopped. And that little novice, he opened his eyes for quite a few hours afterwards. The monks had already gone out on arms round. He's sitting in the hall. All the monks had bowed and left and making noises and the last chanting. And he'd had the most wonderful meditation of his life. He stopped. And I love that story because there he was, a little novice, a lot of negativity. You know, oh, I don't like this. When's Ajahn Chah going to stop? When's he going to stop? And then the, the novice stopped. And he got in there, one of the jhanas. Beautiful story. And of course, the little novice couldn't hear anything. Five senses had stopped. And his mind was just incredibly bright. You know, the little novice, 11 or 12 year old, Missing arms round meant you missed your meal that day. Nothing in the afternoon or evening. And you know, young people, they really need their food. But he wasn't at all concerned. Just so happy and blissed out. OK, the last question. Dear Ajahn, regarding past life, you told yesterday, I'm very curious to find out about mine. When will I know this? Is it possible for everyone? Shall I tell you my past life? In my past life, I was Peter Betts, a student at Cambridge. <laughs> now I'm a monk. Different life. That's just telling a bit of jokes. But I'm obsessed now with early life memories and past life. Can't stop thinking, but I can't remember. Thank you for your teachings. Look, if it, what's the purpose of remembering your past lives or the purpose of remembering your early lives? Sometimes it's just to show these things are possible. But don't obsess about it, because if you need to, if you want the ability to do this, you know, from your own meditation, you need quite peaceful meditations. So still meditations. So instead, just meditate nice and peacefully. Have a good rest tonight. You know, have enough sort of exercise and uh, water and food. So your body is really healthy. And you get up in the morning and meditate and even say to yourself, stop. See if you can hold that piece. Just like the, the donkey stopped and a carrot came right into the donkey's mouth. If you get a deep meditation, you can feel it's a deep meditation. It's so still and so peaceful and joyful. <laughs> then you ask yourself, what is my earliest memory? And see if it comes up. And if your mind is peaceful, it will come up. You don't know maybe what your previous life was, but you know you've lived as a young baby. You're in your mother's womb. Sometimes people get in the mother's womb memories as well. And you can actually feel all of those, and they're really real. And you get one, and the other ones are pretty easy to get afterwards. And it happens. Yes, it's amazing. But you need the deep meditation first of all. So if you try it with just an ordinary meditation, you're wasting your time. So just get the peaceful meditations. Relax to the max and don't want anything in the whole world. And then you'll just remember just the instructions, what's my oldest memory? And who knows? But don't worry. Because if you don't believe in reincarnation in this life, you win in your next. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old joke. 
Arahan Sama. You followed that. What are you following that for? Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Very good. I was remembering my past life in um, Dhammaloka in Serpentine, because that's what we do at the end of the talks there. <laughs> okay, have a beautiful night's sleep and see you in the morning. Well, thank you for all the questions. Any questions I didn't answer properly, just you can write them down again and try again next time.